Hello, everyone. Welcome tonight to this event uh, of the Asia Society Policy Institute on the Xi Jinping and Joe Biden summit. We're calling Diplomacy in Action. I'm really pleased to invite you all here tonight to hear from our Asia Society Policy Institute experts on the results of the summit and what it means amid the many multilateral events that are happening inside Asia and around the world this week. I'm Rory Daniels. I'm the Managing Director of Asia Society Policy Institute, and I'm just delighted to introduce our panel tonight. Joining us, we have our President and CEO and the President of the Asia Society Policy Institute, the Honorable Kevin Rudd. Um, Kevin Rudd served as the 26th Prime Minister of Australia, where he was responsible for um, for serving as a, a, a leader of state in many of these types of events and has also met with many of the key actors who are playing a role in the summits this week. We also have with us our vice president for international trade, Wendy Cutler. Wendy is the former acting deputy U.S. trade representative, where she was responsible for a range of bilateral and multilateral trade issues, um, including some of the major issues in Asia, the Trans-Pacific Partnership among them. We also have with us Danny Russell. Danny is our Vice President for International Security and Diplomacy. He was also the U.S. Acting, I'm sorry, not acting, he was the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and the Pacific, also traveling extensively in this region and um, working on many of the issues that we will be discussing tonight. And we also have with us Takako Hikotani. Takako is our senior fellow at the Asia Society and Asia Society Policy Institute in Tokyo, where she is an expert on Japan's security policy and foreign policy. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, we're here today to talk about the results of um, what has become a, a really uh, important and significant event in U.S.-China relations, which is the meeting on Monday, November 14th, between Chinese leader Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden. Um, given that the, the expectations for this meeting were relatively low, that U.S.-China relations have been deteriorating for some time, that previous attempts at U.S.-China engagement, even in this Biden administration, have been so let's say, a minor impact. Um, Kevin, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your top line takeaways from this summit. Do you think that it met expectations? And uh, what do you think were the most significant outcomes? Well, everyone's going to have different expectations, uh, Rory. Um, but in terms of its concrete outcomes, I'd put it in these terms. As uh, you know, for the last 18 months or so, we at the Asia Society Policy Institute have been arguing for a framework of managed strategic competition between the US and China, given the deteriorating nature of uh, that bilateral relationship. Uh, because we had discovered over a period of time <clears throat> that, in fact, there were no longer any rules of the road, there were no longer any guardrails, and it was, in fact, a relationship in free fall. And as an institute and together with others, we've been working with our friends both in Washington and Beijing to encourage both sides to move in the direction of a managed strategic relationship, a managed competition. So fast forward to uh, the summit of... Uh, for Hi, I'll bear with us for just a moment here while we're experiencing um, a technical difficulty. Um, while we're waiting to get Kevin back on the line to kind of give us a uh, his top line takeaways from the summit, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn to Wendy Cutler. Wendy, um, trade and economic issues have always been a huge part of U.S.-China relations, but bilateral economic issues were mentioned more as a challenge than an opportunity um, in terms of the readouts of this particular summit. I'm wondering if you could tell us uh, from your perspective where you think economic issues will be on the agenda in U.S.-China relations going forward, um, especially with the U.S. hosting APEC next year. Uh, is this an opportunity for, for deepening and broadening economic partnership or does the strategic elements of the economic relationship, um, will they dominate? Uh, 
Thanks, Rory. Um, you know, when I was thinking of the summit just this week, it brought me back to the last summit meeting between a U.S. president and um, Xi Jinping. And that was in June 2019 before between President Trump and Xi Jinping. And the way I recall that meeting, and maybe it's not 100 percent accurate, but trade was front and center of that meeting. They were talking tariffs. They were talking retaliation. They were talking agriculture. They were talking other purchases and structural issues. And what struck me, but you know, with this summit, um, is that trade was barely a topic. Um, in the readout from President Biden, um, he mentioned that the U.S. expressed concern with China's non-market economy practices. And in the Chinese readout, they. Um, I would say, blame the United States for trade wars, technology wars, and decoupling. But then they also talked about the need for the recognition that our economies are integrated and the need for cooperation. And so just, you know, it's a different world. But the question is, like, what are the next steps here? And, you know, we'll get into, I'm sure, how there was an announcement that um, Secretary of State Blinken will be taking a trip to um, China some of the working groups will be resumed and some of the dialogues will be restarted. And in that context, there was talk about the econ and the trade channels um, being restarted. Um, I note that Secretary Yellen sat right next to President Biden at the meeting. Um, but it's unclear when these talks are resumed exactly what could be achieved. Um, there's clearly a need for um, more communication on these issues. They're very important, but both sides seem to be pretty locked in their positions. And it's hard to see a situation, for example, where the U.S. would be lifting tariffs anytime soon, particularly given um, the outcomes in, in our recent elections. Um, and so when I think of all of this, and I think in the context of the G20 going on as we speak, and APEC later in the week, both economic fora, it's unclear you know, what can be achieved. But I'm hopeful when we host APEC next year that there may be small opportunities for the United States and China, along with other APEC countries, to cooperate on issues like food security, like climate and trade, um, like women's empowerment. Um, so we'll have to see, you know, how the G20 plays out this week, how Thailand's hosting of APEC shakes out this week, and what opportunities um, are on the agenda going forward. But I think just in conclusion, the best opportunity for U.S.-China economic cooperation is in the context of these multilateral organizations. I just don't see bilateral talks moving the dial very much at this point. Yeah, that's a really, really good point um, and interesting perspective. Certainly, uh, the readouts from the meetings referenced all of the global problems um, for which it is incumbent upon the U.S. and China to manage the re relationship responsibly, um, as Kevin was saying before we lost him. Um, since he's come right back on, Kevin, we want to just pick up, pick up right where you left off. Um, we were just talking about how, you know, the the agenda for the meeting, um, not just the agenda for the meeting, but also the readouts for the meeting referenced a lot of global problems where the U.S. and China need to manage the relationship responsibly. I mean, if I could just ask a further question um, to the points that you were making before we lost you, um, do you think that this meeting, you know, pointed in the right direction to managing the relationship responsibly and to building some of the guardrails um, that have been, you know, a key focus of your work at the Asia Society and the Asia Society Policy Institute? Well, the bottom line is the administration and a full up, full of grown up and experienced people who would have probably headed in this direction anyway. Uh, what those of us who are in the think tank community have been urging is a set of approaches to managing strategic competition with China, which I'm sure have complemented pre existing uh, predilections on their part anyway. If you drill into the substance of it beyond the language changes that I referred to before uh, on the Chinese side, I think what you see underneath it is the critical machinery question 
of, quote, officials engaging now in strategic communications, unquote. Uh, that I take as code language for the likes of the Secretary of State, the likes of um, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and their Chinese counterparts to get down and to nail a series of practical arrangements. What might that be in practice over Taiwan? That'll be for both sides to determine. But on the Chinese side, it would be useful, for example, if uh, their military flight activities began to reobserve the median line. And on the American side, it'd be very useful that the United States Congress, for example, uh, together with uh, others, uh, were to observe more rigorously uh, the uh, One China policy, as has been agreed in the three joint communiques going back to 1970. Yeah, I think to pick up what, on what Kevin was saying, and apologies, we're all over the world today, so our connections are um, very varied depending on where we are, that the U.S. and China have um, long, long had differing views about the, um, the issue of U.S.-Taiwan unofficial relations, and um, this is certainly an area of deep contention between the U.S. and China that came out very clearly in the statements um, on both sides in the press conference afterward uh, from the Biden administration, from the president himself. Um, Danny, if I could turn to you uh, again while we are trying to get Kevin back on the line. Um, you know, I, I noticed that um, coming out of the 20th Party Congress, where Xi Jinping has really consolidated his power, where he's put um, people who are close and loyal to him in key positions, that the Chinese uh, foreign policy uh, apparatus, um, the statements that are coming out of top Chinese leadership have really shifted quite a bit from what we saw in the previous um, couple of years, which I would describe as, as wolf warriorism, as um, very nationalistic, very defensive um, and somewhat aggressive assertions of Chinese interests and Chinese foreign policy to this much more um, conciliatory, pragmatic tone where uh, China is talking about the need to manage the U.S. relationship responsibly to work on areas of global concern and to, um, to use dialogue and uh, frank and candid discussion to, to deal with some of the major areas of difference. I mean, from your perspective, um, what do you make of this turnabout in behavior? Um, how do you explain it? And um, where do you think that this is going? Well, thanks, Rory. Um, it might be a little premature to uh, conclude that the, that the wolves, that nationalism uh, has, has gone from Chinese diplomacy. And, you know, Xi Jinping himself was never the wolf. He was the one who sent the wolves out to, uh, to hunt. Um, you know, if you take a step back and look, since the beginning of the COVID uh, epidemic, Xi Jinping's been effectively quarantined in China two and a half years. He hasn't left. And, and of course, in the last uh, phase, he's been consumed with a really monumental domestic political task at home, essentially remaking the Chinese Communist Party in his own image and I'd have with breathtaking success. So Right now, with that uh, political mission successfully completed, as you pointed out, and with the COVID situation enabling careful international travel and with the big summit season upon us, Xi Jinping has stepped back onto the international stage. And, you know, at one level, it's just as simple as that. Um, so maybe it's not so much a reversal as much as it is kind of moving to the next phase, going, allowing or taking advantage of the opportunities now. He's put his domestic political house in order. And so now he's turning to China's international standing and international engagement, which has always been very important to him. And he's doing it from a position of strength. He's hosted you know, a range of leaders in Beijing and more to come. He held a regional summit in Uzbekistan now he's meeting everybody in Bali or in Bangkok, not just President Biden, but leaders from all around the world. He's making up for a lost time. And, you know, this isn't without a purpose. Uh, he's always put a lot of emphasis on telling China's story and building a correct understanding of 
China's positions and China's policies. He has um, insisted that China has an important role in shaping global governance, his global development initiative, his global security initiative. Uh, he's moved the sort of Chinese spectrum beyond just China's own borders. Um, you heard Xi Jinping in the 20th Party Congress explain that uh, the external environment is, is turbulent, it's filled with risk. So he's venturing out to try to shape that environment. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a duality in his economic policy, right? Dual circulation. It, he wants to protect China against the outside world. At the same time, he wants to take advantage of what the outside world offers to strengthen China. So that kind of duality, I think, uh, exists throughout Chinese policies and, and certainly in Chinese diplomacy. So this might be an instance where we're seeing um, a more pragmatic side, but perhaps that is, you know, a question of the timing of the events that are to unfold um, and of the position that, you know, that um, Secretary General Xi is in right now. Um, certainly this description of the environment around uh, China and in the international system as being volatile, um, not only tracks well with, I think, the, the rest of the world's um, assessment of where we are today, uh, given, you know, international energy crisis, food crisis, Russia's evasion of Ukraine, you name it. There's certainly a number of um, serious problems, COVID-19 and pandemic shortages, supply chain issues notwithstanding, that she is facing. But he's also facing, I think, a, um, a really rededicated U.S. security posture in the region um, following many years of the Trump administration um, you know, and it's uh, almost disdain for the alliance system and what it offered for U.S. interests. The Biden administration has really reinvested in U.S. alliances in Asia. And certainly no alliance is, you know, more foundational to U.S. security posture and U.S. policy posture in Asia than the U.S.-Japan alliance. So, Takako, if I can turn to you, um, I'd love to get your perspective on the results of the summit in Japan um, how is the, you know, the summit looking from the perspective of Japan and um, what are people discussing as kind of next steps in uh, regional policy, uh, given a what seems to be a at least temporary stabilization of U.S.-China relations? Yes, thanks, Rory. Um, I was looking at the different headlines of newspapers um, in Japan yesterday, and it was interesting that the title and the subtitles were both the same across the board, but in slightly different order. The title and subtitle were either fail to narrow differences over Taiwan, but continue dialogue um, to prevent um, collision. So basically, it's not surprising that the U.S. and China could not narrow their differences, their own parallel tracks. But it, there is some kind of a sigh of relief that they are communicating to avoid conflict. And that's what Japan wants to see is a stable, managed um, strategic competition between Japan, uh, between the U.S. and China is something that Japan would want to see. So now I think in Japan, the discussion has shifted um, to what's going to take place on the 17th between um, um, Prime Minister Kishida and, and Chinese leader Xi Jinping. And that's going to be what's going to be talked about already. And also just to add what has been covered um, in Japan preceding the um, the U.S.-China summit meeting has always also been very important that at the East Asia summit um, in Phnom Penh, um, there was a um, Japan ROK summit, um, Japan U.S. summit and Japan um, U.S. Uh, ROK trilateral meeting. So those meetings preceded what happened, uh, what we see in, in uh, U.S. and um, China. So this whole series of summit meetings is something that we might want to look back after it's all done. But right now in Japan, the attention is to what's going to be happening on the 17th. Thanks. 
Absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you for reminding us that um, there are bilateral meetings that are happening um, all across the region this week, not just between the U.S. leaders and um, counterparts in Asia, but also in and among the different um, counterparts within Asia. Um, certainly an active and busy time for diplomacy. Um, Kevin, if I could come back to you and um, apologies for for um, skipping around on some of these issues, but I really do want to get your perspective. Um, after the, the summit concluded, um, the Chinese uh, side issued a very lengthy readout um, that read to me, you know, not just as a uh, summary of the meeting, but also really as an explanation or defense of Chinese policy, the Chinese system, um, Chinese worldview. I'm wondering um, from your perspective, like what stood out to you about this statement and how does it follow from the results from the content of the 20th Party Congress? Well, thank you again for coming back to me. I apologize for the uh, Wi-Fi link uh, uh, from Singapore, where I am at the moment. So I've gone off Wi-Fi. So uh, we'll see how we go. Uh, on the question of um, the length of the Chinese readout, you're right, it's unusual. Danny Russell, I'm sure, will have comments on this. He's consumed this for decades in his own uh, diplomatic career with the State Department. But I've never seen one which is three and a half, four pages long uh, from the Chinese side. Secondly, when you look at the language contained within it, it strikes me that it's a system which chose, perhaps through bureaucratic self-preservation, not to try and summarise what Xi Jinping said, but actually to largely paraphrase or quote what he said in the meeting. Um, not all of it, but large slabs of it. And then thirdly, when you get down to uh, the, the guts of it, uh, which is in and around uh, Taiwan, in and, uh, in and around the future of, let's call it economic decoupling, and in and around the question of Ukraine, I think you're right, Rory, to say that uh, Xi Jinping uh, has uh, used this as an opportunity to, quote, get China's story out, unquote. Danny Russell made reference to that before. Because there's an underlying assumption on Xi Jinping's part that uh, we put poor benighted creatures in the West or poor benighted creatures in the rest of the democratic world, if only the scales would fall from our eyes and we were to finally apprise ourselves of the underlying truths of the Chinese position, then frankly, differences would evaporate. Well, I think we all know that's not quite the case in reality. I think uh, to go to the last part of your question about the commonalities between this three and a half page readout on the one hand, um, and uh, Xi Jinping's ideological framework as uh, expounded most recently in the 20th Party Congress. Uh, what struck me uh, in the readout was the fact that he was blunt about China's redefinition of the terms freedom, democracy, and human rights. That is, uh, he has a way of uh, reinterpreting those within the Marxist-Leninist tradition, which are completely uh, at odds with the liberal tradition. Secondly, um, he also goes to the question of Chinese style modernization. Again, that's a new innovation in the 20th Party Congress report. And essentially, it's saying uh, to the world at large that we're going to obtain economic modernity, but leave all that cultural and, shall we say, uh, ideational influence of the West to one side, including Western notions of human rights, freedom and democracy as well. Uh, and I think uh, if you again look carefully at it, uh, he is quite deliberate in his assertion that America and China have chosen dip different development paths and China has chosen what he describes as a socialist development path. Uh, and this, th these, therefore, will have different destinations. If there's one other point of resonance with the 20th Party Congress report, I think it is this. And that is that um, if you look carefully at the uh, earlier a document from the report, uh, it is quite clear about its um, confidence statement uh, that China is on an inexorable path towards national rejuvenation, choosing this Chinese style of modernization, uh, and that world history is indeed at a crossroads. Uh, 
and that is code language for the continued rise of the East and the decline of the West, which is further code language for the rise of China and the decline of the United States. And again, you go to the lengthy readout within the uh, summit meeting with uh, Joe Biden. And there again, you find the language of the world is at a crossroads and that China's uh, inevitable path towards national rejuvenation continues. So the similarities, therefore, between the 20th Party Congress doctrine on China's path to development and its destination for development is remarkably reflected in this um, three and a half page readout as well, lifted more or less directly from the Congress report. Back to you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, that is a very interesting and salient point, I think, about Chinese style modernization. Um, so often when we think about the U.S. and China being in some sort of strategic competition, the question in my mind is, what are we competing over and what does that competition reflect about what each side thinks the rest of the world wants? Um, and I think for sure that there is a... Uh, that modernization is a theme that really resonates in the rest of the world, and maybe particularly with some of the countries that have been um, attending summits this week. Um, as we know, this is all happening in this much larger context. So, um, so we're in the middle now of the, the G20. And Wendy, I want to come back to you. You know, Xi Jinping has had uh, a lot of dance partners on his card this week, as Danny discussed, um, you know, he's been meeting right and left with um, leaders from European countries, uh, leaders from East Asian countries. Um, but, you know, despite the kind of positive signals that this flurry of diplomacy is sending, that even the, the relatively constructive tone of the U.S.-China bilateral um, summit brought you know, it's not clear that a pause or a reframing of U.S.-China strategic competition is going to be enough to pay dividends in some of these international forums and really drive the action that's necessary for um, all of the countries to participate in problem solving. So I'm wondering if you can walk us through the, the trade and econ side of what's happening at these meetings. Um, where do you think the G20 is going to leave off as it passes Chairman over to India for 2023. Yeah, this is really a tough G20. I mean, enormous challenges and really a time in the world where the G20 is really needed, but also at a time where the G20 is probably the least capable of delivering. And so, you know, when I look at the Xi Biden meeting, if this had been like 10 years ago, they would have spent a good amount of their discussion on ways to work together to kind of, you know, move the G20 and, and produce deliverables. But my sense is that probably wasn't even on the agenda. I mean, they gave lip service to working together on transnational issues and the importance of food security and climate, et cetera. But, you know, did they identify how they can work together and bring other countries on board and get, you know, some bold, you know, new action agreed to during the G20 week? I just don't see that happening. I think the G20 has been mired with geopolitical divisions and a lot of the G20 discussion is centered around how they're going to address you know, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, whether they can do this in a joint statement somehow, or whether they're going to have dissenting votes or not. And then this has all been complicated over the past 18 hours with the latest developments in Poland. And so, you know, when you look at what this G20 either communique or probably I would predict probably some kind of chair statement, um, I think it's going to be weak on deliverables. I think it can identify the challenges and the problems that G20 countries are facing. I think, Rory, you, you ticked them off before. It's food security, oil prices, inflation, the strong dollar, interest rates, COVID lockdowns, and you can go on and on. And on top of it, the IMF once again has adjusted its forecasts where global economic growth this year will be 3.2%, next year now down to 2.7%. And so I guess what I say is India is going to have a full agenda for the G20 next year. 
There may be some language about some issues that are important where work will continue, um, particularly issues like um, you know debt forgiveness, multilateral development bank reform, um, macroeconomic coordination. But I think, again, I think the G20 is going to be weak on deliverables, a lot of talk on the challenges, and then there'll be a handoff to India where they'll be left with a full agenda. You know, we could all be pleasantly surprised at the, at, you know, tomorrow um, when the G20 concludes. Um, but at least at this juncture, it just seems to me that these geopolitical divisions have really weakened the G20's ability to deliver. I suppose um, it's because, uh, Wendy, I have this sense of custodial ownership of the G20, given I'm one of its co-founders from 089. Here is, I think, the two utilities of what is being delivered through the G20 in this meeting, uh, and possibly three. One is in the absence of the G20, which is the only international gathering really, which brings Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, and the US president regularly together each year. Uh, it at least ensures that whatever the state of the U.S.-China bilateral relationship, uh, that uh, these two uh, heads of government and heads of state have the opportunity uh, to meet and without having to construct the pretext of having a separate bilateral visit to each other's countries. In other words, it regularises normal summit diplomacy. I think the second utility of this gathering is that uh, Putin actually found it too hot to handle because he knew that he'd be in a minority of probably two in the room, himself with some significant but not complete support from Xi Jinping. And therefore, uh, the sight of so many countries around the world gathered at head of government level, delivering a reasonably uniform, not totally uniform position on Ukraine, uh, reflects the force of much of international opinion on the war. And the third thing is, looking at the repair job to the global institutions, which is long overdue, the one small encouraging element in the subtext of the Chinese readout is a reauthorization for official level collaboration between the US and China in uh, two or three areas. Uh, one is um, global financial, uh, uh, global macroeconomic stability. The second is trade. Uh, the third, I think, is food security. And most critically, the fourth is climate. And within about a half an hour of the latter being announced, you had John Kerry and Xi Jinhua off of the blocks meeting in Sharm El Sheikh, having been put into the freezer room uh, effectively uh, at the period immediately following the uh, Pelosi visit. So I think that would be my three additions to what uh, Wendy has just listed, uh, a legitimate pessimism about overall outcomes, but I find three cracks of light, which I thought I should add to. I really appreciate that. Thank you for that. And I think it also brought up some of the um, the other contours of this discussion that we're having tonight that are important to surface. I mean, one, I think, is that um, is that the U.S. and China did have some significant outcomes in restarting bilateral dialogue on areas where they have where both sides have a common interest um, the other, perhaps, is, you know, how to manage this larger strategic competition between the U.S. and China and the commitment to, um, I think the readout said, uh, dialogue on principles. So having a more generalized discussion in addition to the very practical and pragmatic um, areas where the two sides are already um, able to meet and have some progress. Um, and hopefully, you know, the the discussion on principles and the issues where the two sides do not get along and are more prone to conflict, whether that's over Taiwan or ideological um, government systems, human rights, et cetera, um, I think the hope is that, you know, we can avoid another situation as developed after Pelosi's visit where um, the issues that that are really um, contentious in the relationship did have a negative effect on the issues where the two sides can cooperate. So finding that that balance and that compartmentalization and the delinking of issues, I think, um, is a positive sign coming out of the summit that should be highlighted. Um, however, with all of that said, there the, these areas where the two sides disagree um, are are very uh, real and serious and dramatic and substantive. 
And I want to turn back a little to what uh, Wendy highlighted about the G20, that it's become a forum for um, geostrategic issues, particularly in light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine this year. And of course, um, as Kevin pointed out, you know, China has not been immune from criticism for its position or non-position, in some would say, on Ukraine. So Danny, um, I want to ask you about the, the developments of the last week in terms of China-Russia relations. Um, I have certainly noticed that China started really publicly distancing itself from Russia, um, maybe over the last several weeks, but particularly over the last week or so, um, you know, really calling into question, you know, if not the, um, the fact of the invasion and its uh, violation of sovereignty, at least the conduct um, that Putin has directed so far in Ukraine. Um, of course, you know, Zelensky uh, did attend virtually and gave remarks at the G20 summit, whereas Putin did not. Um, G- Zelensky calling it the G19, I think, for that very reason, to attack the legitimacy of Russia even being a part of this grouping anymore. Um where are we with global coordination on Russia? Um, what can we make of China kind of pointing out the daylight between Beijing and Moscow? Um, how do you read the developments of the last week or so on this issue? I may not be quite as sanguine as you are on a change in attitude uh, by Beijing on this. I mean, it's the German chancellor uh, made a big point of having moved uh, Xi Jinping a half step uh, towards the P5 consensus. I, I'm not sure I'd award a Nobel Prize to a nuclear power for just restating the position that a nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think Xi Jinping in uh, Bali today joined Lavrov in blocking the G20 from referring to the war in Ukraine as a war. Uh, that's not what people normally mean when they say they're anti-war. So what I see, frankly, when I look at how China is handling the Russian invasion uh, and Putin more broadly is, is honestly, it's kind of clumsy hedging. Uh, and it looks a lot more like they're distancing themselves from a loser than that they're standing on principle. It's also, uh, this is, forgive you, forgive this digression, but it, it's also a, a huge missed opportunity for China. Imagine the boost to China's international prestige and stature if, you know, instead of standing on the sidelines and mouthing these platitudes about all sides should show restraint and so on, it had moved in with, you know, diplomatic acumen, using its strong ties to both Moscow and Kiev, to broker some sort of pause or to put some sort of process in place. Like, why was it that the Turks were able to engineer the safe passage for grain shipments uh, in the uh, in the face of a global food security crisis? And some of this grain goes to China, among other places. Why wasn't Beijing able to? Uh, to move in, uh, move beyond slogans, take action, shape events. I think that really would have uh, won immense respect for China and showed China as uh, as a, acting as a major power. Anyway, that, that's my digression. But as you know, I think what we see has been an awkward attempt to hedge. On the one hand, China doesn't want to be associated with or doesn't want to be tainted by uh Putin's aggression, let alone his failure and his incompetence. This is not China's fight. And China is certainly not willing to uh, risk dangerous sanctions against its own companies by providing military support or contributing uh, international rules. On the other hand, Beijing clearly sees Russia as a, as a crucial partner in the effort to push back against American hegemony against the you know League of Democracies that uh, Beijing and Moscow and others seem kind of aligned against them. And I think that the Chinese have shown that they're fully on board with the argument that 
American containment strategy is what it's what forces countries like Russia, like China to push back. And it's the an uncomfortable truth that a large number of countries around the world also seem to agree that, you know, it was the U.S. and NATO that drove Putin you know, into a corner and they brought this on themselves. So uh, I think this ties to your earlier question about Xi Jinping's active diplomacy. He's not going to uh, back down in the effort to reshape global governance. And as Kevin astutely pointed out, you know, when it comes to uh, things like freedom and human rights and democracy, he's not pleading guilty for failing on these scores. No, he's taking a page out of George Orwell's book, and he's redefining what these things mean in ways that suit the Chinese system. So there is really a lot going on here. Agreed. Absolutely. Um, I do think that the, you know, the the U.S. administration, the Biden readout, the press conference afterward, um, you know, however, the however, the commitment to, you know, not having um, use of nuclear weapons under any circumstances at any time may have whatever the motivation was behind the Chinese commitment there. I think that the Biden administration is trying to highlight that um, to take it and use it as a um, as a commitment, as a starting point to, you know, wrap up other issues within it, um, none of which may be more important uh, to Japan and the U.S. alliance system, Japan, U.S. ROK relations than North Korea. Um, Takako, I want to turn back to you to maybe drill down a little bit deeper into U.S.-Japan ROK trilateral relations. Um, as you mentioned, there was a summit happening um, on the sidelines of, I think, the, the ASEAN meeting over the weekend or the EAS over the weekend. And um, there was a considerable amount of attention on North Korea's provocative, recent provocative missile tests Um and launches. So uh, wondering kind of if you could bring us up to date on how the rest of the strategic picture in Northeast Asia is looking. Um, what are the kind of prospects for uh, U.S. diplomacy bringing Korea and Japan a little closer together? And how should we think about uh, what the three countries can do together or potentially what the implications of the U.S.-China summit are on dealing with North Korea? Right. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, there was a summit meeting between Japan and um, China and Korean leaders, um, and there wasn't that much of a um, any solution to the forced labor issue and the difficult questions um, lying between the by, uh, by the two countries. But I think one positive um, news that I read, which was interesting, I thought, was that um, is uh, Korea just announced its uh, free and open Indo-Pacific or Indo-Pacific strategy um, on 11th of November, and Kishida is announcing his in the spring, and there is going to be some coordination between the two. And I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I think it's good that there are some common ground for them to talk about on the future of the region as a whole. And as for the trilateral, they did, um, Japan, um, US, and ROK discussed um, sharing information about um, a North Korean missile data and also to um, jointly um, advocate against any further nuclear development or provocations from North Korea. And also, um, interestingly, um, North Korea, I mean, ROK also joined in announcing the importance of the peace and st stability of the Taiwan Straits. So I think altogether, I think for the three countries, I think it's a very important, interesting development. And I do look forward to what happens with the Japan-China summit that we're seeing, we're um, um, expecting on the 17th. That is the first time since December 2019 between Abe and Xi, Abe visited um, um, Beijing and, um, and she was supposed to um, come to Japan in return when the cherry blossoms bloom in April 2019, but I think uh, April 2020, but I think we all remember that that was not possible because of COVID. So uh, whether or not, I think we're at a very different place 
than we were in 2019 in terms of bilateral relationship and also between the U.S. and China. But um, hopefully there's some prog- hopefully there has been more efforts in Japan from between Japan and China to open up the communication to deal with um, the possible um, there's enough worry that things might be going in the wrong direction, that there has been discussion uh, between um, the NSC chief Akiba and his counterpart in China that lasted for seven hours in August. So I'm hopeful that these kind of efforts to open up channels for um, more communication to avoid unnecessary conflict, as well as cooperation on areas, issue areas such as uh, medicine, environment, and these kind of other areas between Japan and China that could be done not necessarily independent of Japan's relation with, with um, the U.S., but somewhat in a more multilateral fora would be a way for the U.S.-Japan-China relationship to possibly help the stability of the broader region and also Japan, um, I mean, U.S.-China relations as well. So hopefully these developments, and I'm not exactly sure what exactly will be talked about on the 17th, but hopefully this will contribute to the larger strategic environment as well. Thanks. It'll be really interesting to see what happens on the 17th and whether there are concrete deliverables coming out of that meeting or if it's more of this like testing the waters, um, figuring out how to repair damage. Um, I can't resist since we have Kevin here asking about the Xi Albanese meeting that also happened this week. Kevin, could you give us your readout on what the uh, meeting meant for China-Australia relations, which have also been incredibly strained over the last few years? Yes, yeah, so assisting carefully to Kakako's saying, it's been three years since uh, the Japanese Prime Minister and the Chinese President have met. It's six years since an Australian <laughs> Prime Minister and a uh, and a Chinese President met, which uh, indicates um, the level of, um, shall we say, pan-regional friction that we've been in both prior to COVID uh, and subsequent to COVID, as well as during COVID. Um, one other point I'd make, uh, which has been... Uh, um, triggered in my mind by what Takako just said about the events of 2019. What was fascinating about Abe-san's, shall we say, brief flirtation with Beijing in 2019-2020 slash uh, was, of course, uh, Abe-san's concern, in my judgment, about where Trump was taking the United States in the long term. Um, and therefore, there was an attempt by Abe San, who had been consistently hawkish on China, to begin to manage the Japan-China relationship in a different way against uncertainties at that stage about the long-term strategic reliability of the United States, given the eccentricities of the Trump administration. Of course, um, that um, soon disappeared once we were into the realities of COVID and then the further geopolitical fractures which occurred after that. I think the other point I would add, uh, again, building on something that uh, Danny said about a missed diplomatic opportunity vis-a-vis the Ukraine by the Chinese, um, is that um, uh, what he just referred to, which is uh, China backing uh, Russia in the person of Foreign Minister Lavrov, um, on a question of whether the G20 uh, could refer to quote, the special operation by the Russian Federation in Ukraine, unquote, special military operation by the Russian Federation in Ukraine as an invasion or a war. In terms of missed opportunity, Xi Jinping would have been seen to have done that in the physical company of the German Chancellor, the French President, the new British Prime Minister, uh, the new uh, Prime Minister of Italy, uh, as well as, uh, from memory, the prime ministers of Spain and the Netherlands. So in terms of a stark reminder about where China has chosen basically to line up on the geopolitics of Ukraine and Russia, it was um, sobering, I'm sure, for those European heads of government to see ultimately where China cast its dice. Um, Lest you think I'm avoiding the Australia question, let me now turn to it briefly. Uh, I haven't had an opportunity to speak with Australian officials um, since uh, the meeting, uh, let alone the PM or his office. So, but my observation is that given it's been six years, this was quite a significant development in the long 50 year long uh, diplomatic relationship between the two countries. We've never had that sort of a gap in high level contact between the two sides. And it comes on the back of what's been a ministerial freeze 
a more ministerial contact for some three years in duration. And of course, that was lifted with the election, the election of the new Australian government in May of this year. Uh, if you look, however, for the substance of the outcome uh, of the uh, Albanese Xi Jinping bilateral, uh, there is not a significant uh, readout at this stage. It was more a case of what I would describe as drawing something of a line under the past. Uh, and therefore, it'll depend on future processes in terms of dealing with the outstanding issues such as the unilateral imposition by China of some $16 billion worth of uh, trade bans on Australian exports to China in punishment for the previous Australian government's uh, unilateral call for a, a global inquiry uh, into the origins of COVID-19. This was classic Chinese punishment strategy 101 in the ancient Confucian textbook. So those measures haven't been lifted. Um, I think that'll be the subject of subsequent processes. But if you like, the relationship has been brought in from the cold and now the communication is reoccurring at all levels. Back to you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, thanks for that uh, brilliant summary of uh, where things stand after this latest round of diplomacy between China and Australia as well. Um, we're coming up to the end of our time. I encourage you, if you have a question and you're here with our live audience, you haven't asked it yet, please do put it into the box. I'll do my best to get to a couple of those um, over the next 10 minutes or so. Um, we do have a question coming in on the topic of how the, the summit and the ability for the U.S. and China to manage the relationship was seen in the region, perhaps among countries of Southeast Asia. Um, we all know that, you know, even in the, the press conference and statements leading up to the summit, that there was an acknowledgement, let's say, by the U.S. side that the countries of the world, particularly Southeast Asia, do not want to have to choose between the U.S. and China. I'm wondering maybe, Danny, if I can turn to you and ask, um, how do you think this, this summit is playing among those countries? Do they see the opportunity for a uh, more orderly strategic competition? And um, is this music to their ears or are they listening for some screeching notes down the line? Or in, in my experience, there isn't a country in Southeast Asia and there's hardly a country on planet Earth that doesn't want to have the best of both worlds, which is to say uh, to have uh, good relations and, and profitable relations with both China and the United States. There's certainly not a country in Southeast Asia that doesn't worry that the U.S. and China might be goading each other into uh, conflict, uh, confrontation that would be disastrous uh, at a minimum economically and uh, potentially much, much worse than that. So, yeah, I think it's safe to say that uh, by and large, the region breathed a sigh of relief that Xi Jinping and Joe Biden met. Uh, acted like adults, if not old friends, and that uh, based on the readouts, which in this case didn't directly contravene each other, uh, there was a uh, you know, meaningful and a civil conversation that pointed towards the future, that opened the prospect of uh, a discussion about principles that would guide the relationship, that uh, accepted, very importantly, uh, that both nations recognize their responsibility to uh, contribute to solving the world's problems and not exacerbating them. I, I would add, you know, Kevin gave three good uh, precepts on the, the G20. I would add uh, maybe a, a fourth or a corollary, which is that I think that the fact that Biden and she were meeting not just in Southeast Asia, but in the context of the G20, really probably brought home to both leaders that sense that uh, the world has expectations, uh, that the world is, in fact, demanding that uh, the U.S. and China put squabbles aside and work on climate and extreme weather, work on, uh, on developing nation uh, crushing debt loads, work on global food security, work on uh, global health. And so uh, in addition to uh, 
the impact that the U.S. and uh, China may have on the G20, I think the G20 had an impact on the U.S. and China. And Rory, if I can just add, you know, it's interesting through all these different bilaterals and different groupings, the U.S. did come forward with a number of initiatives with money behind them, um, one sponsored on infrastructure and climate with, with Indonesia, um, others with different groupings of countries, you know, many directed towards Southeast Asia. And I'd also remind the viewers that Biden's now going to be coming home from the G20 and he'll be, you know, and Vice President Harris will be on her way out to the APEC meeting and then on to the Philippines. So I think Southeast Asia this week is getting a lot of attention from, you know, the most senior folks in the administration who are not only coming with words this time, but I think with with deliverables and concrete um, projects to back up these words. And I'm, you know, someone who worked on APEC for many years during my government service. I'm pretty excited about our hosting of APEC next year. I think if we do it right, um, it's an enormous opportunity to further demonstrate our commitment to the region. Thanks. Yeah, that would be a very positive development, I think, in, you know, for uh, the U.S. and the world if strategic competition between the U.S. and China took the form of uh, who can provide more public goods. Um, and certainly it's significant that the U.S. has, I think, listened to and absorbed criticism that it's been absent from many of these forums, um, either absent in its leadership participation or absent when it comes to um, backing up its initiatives and plans with uh, financing. Um, we have just a couple minutes left, so I'd like to turn to Takako and then to Kevin. Um, same question to both of you. Um, we've noted today that the, while um, it does seem that the U.S. and China were able to reset the tone of the conversation that could be had between the two leaders, that you know a lot of the hard work of uh, managing the areas of difference and um, making progress on critical global issues is yet to come. And it's going to come in a relatively short period before the U.S. enters its next election season, having just wrapped up an election. We're practically overnight from starting the next one. Um, and also at a time when, you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of attention being paid to to other global issues. So Takako, Kevin, um, I'll start with you, Takako. Uh, what is your expectation for the next steps in U.S.-China bilateral diplomacy or in U.S.-China regional diplomacy? And Kevin, the question will be the same to you when Takako finishes. Um, I don't have much to add on the U.S.-China dimension, but if I were to say, um, uh, from the J Japan's point of view, the prime minister uh, is really hoping for a diplomatic boost uh, a bit, or a bounce from um, his dif diplomatic efforts because his um, popularity rating is suffering in Japan. And he's looking forward to a summit meeting hosted in his host, hometown of um, Hiroshima next year. So towards that goal, I am, ho I am hopeful that he will re-engage in um, doing what Japan has been doing for the past couple of years, stepping up on behalf of, in a way, or try to engage the U.S. in multilateral fora, um, such as IPEF, and also to do something more concrete measures for a, a different initiatives, specifically on climate change and so forth. But the other aspect is what Japan does on its own uh, for its own defense should be hopefully a stabilizing factor in the strategic dynamic, dynamic in the region and will be in court, uh, close coordination with the U.S. on that matter. So hopefully that will lead towards more um, stable managed competition than um, the other way around. So hopefully what Japan does in both bilateral and multilateral effort, efforts will have a con contribute to the region and for the relationship between Japan, I mean, the United States and China. That's what Thanks, Takako. Over to you, Kevin, for the last word. Please close us out. Okay. The last word, and if I can remember them, I'm going to make five bullet points. Number one, <clears throat> what I think both sides have done with this uh, summit is signal is that they are crab walking towards a form of managed strategic competition. Uh, whether the language is guardrails, whether it's rules of the road, uh, whether it is uh, security safety nets um, or managed competition itself, there is a predisposition on both readouts uh, to put some sort of floor under this relationship rather than allow it to continue to fall through the floor uh, in the form of free fall that we had before. Uh, 
I think that's the first point. Second, however, is that that's very much for the short to medium term. A realist reading of the readouts on the Chinese side mean that for the medium to long term, China's position on Taiwan is just as hard as it was and, in fact, arguably, is hardened in terms of the language used in this particular Chinese readout from the uh, summit with President Biden. So we should be under no illusion that for the medium to long term, uh, as I think Takako said before, uh, these two countries are very much on uh, parallel tracks, uh, not parallel tracks in the sense of moving in the same direction, but in tracks heading towards uh, a form of um, long-term conflict over Taiwan, unless China itself can be deterred from doing that late 20s and early 30s, in my judgment. The third point is, and to, we don't often give credit to anybody, uh, but to give credit to the US administration for what is an increasingly coherent national security strategy uh, towards China. Uh, if you put together Secretary Blinken's statement in May this year, delivered in Washington at the Asia Society on the three elements of his China strategy, the national security strategy released by uh, Nats, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan in um, September, October, and then the national defence strategy, plus the measures which have been announced by the United States on 7 October on semiconductor exports, these add up to, frankly, a coherent strategic armory. And I believe these have had an effect uh, on the Chinese perceptions reinforcing a Chinese predisposition to, I won't say to push the strategic pause button, but to also look um, positively in the direction of the need to stabilise this relationship in the here and now. Uh, the fourth point is, and uh, Wendy and others have pointed to this, is there's still the missing element in US grand strategy towards China is the economic and trade piece. Um, IPEF was one step in the right direction, but in regional reactions, a thin step. Uh, US hosting of APEC uh, provides a whole host of new opportunities to fill in this missing gap because that is where the strength of China's regional and global strategy lies in the size of its trade footprint, the size of its econom economic footprint as well. And my final point uh, overall uh, is that when you ask what's going to be next in terms of the real diplomacy, uh, I think um, uh, if you look at the low-hanging fruit, which are identified in the Chinese readout, uh, we should now look to see what Secretary Kerry um, and Xie Jinhua can produce in Sharm El Sheikh, uh, a meeting which at present uh, has not been achieving much progress at all, and where because they've now been reauthorised to re-engage, they may be able to inject some energy in the last days of Sharm El Sheikh in order to bring about a better outcome that was otherwise going to be the case on climate. So that would be my five-point takeout, and I'm proud of the fact I could remember five points without writing them down. Back to you, Rory. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thanks to all of you for your insights tonight. We've covered a lot of ground in this meeting, and, um, and bringing it to a close, I'd just like to add that for all of you out there watching tonight or in the future, um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more and having a bit of a deeper dive on some of the issues that we've covered tonight in security, trade, global public health, both regional, global, and um, with U.S.-China in general, uh, please do visit our website at asiasociety.org, where you can find the work of the Asia Society Policy Institute, its new Center for China Analysis, as well as the um, brilliant work of the Asia Society's Center on U.S.-China Relations. Again, that's asiasociety.org, where you'll find our, our insights and also our upcoming events Thanks so much for joining us tonight and look forward to seeing you next time.